Old Yeller, Chapter 4 A couple of days later, I had another and better reason for wanting to get rid of Old Yeller. That was when the two Longhorn Range Bulls met at the house and pulled off their big fight. We first heard the bulls while we were eating our dinner of cornbread, roasted venison, and green watercress gathered from below the spring. One bull came from off a high rocky ridge to the south of the cabin. We could hear his angry rumbling as he moved down through the thickets of cat claw and scrub oak. Then he lifted his voice in a wild brassy blare that set echoes clamoring in the draws and canyons for miles around. That old bull's talking fight, I told Mama and little Arliss. He's bragging that he's the biggest and toughest and meanest. He's telling all the other bulls that they got a lick of sense they'll take to cover when he's around. Almost before I'd finished talking, we heard the second bull. He was over about the salt licks somewhere. His bellering was just as loud and braggy as the first ones. He was telling the first bull that his fight talk was all bluff. He was saying that he was the big bull of the range, that he was the biggest and meanest and toughest. We sat and ate and listened to them. We could tell by their rumblings and bawlings that they were gradually working their way down through the brush toward each other and were getting madder by the minute. I always like to see a fight between bulls or bears or wild boars or almost any wild animals. Now I got so excited that I jumped up from the table and went to the door and stood listening. I'd made up my mind that if the bulls met and started a fight, I was going to see it. There was still plenty of careless weeds and crabgrass that needed hoeing out of the corn, but I guessed I could let them go long enough to see a bullfight. Our cabin stood on a high knoll about a hundred yards above the spring. Years ago, Papa had cleared out all the brush and trees from around it, leaving a couple of live oaks near the house for shade. That was so he could get a clear shot at any Comanche or Apache coming to scalp us. And while I stood there at the door, the first bull entered the clearing, right where Papa had one time shot a Comanche off his horse. He was a leggy, mustard-colored bull with black freckles speckling his jaws and the underside of his belly. He had one great horn set for hooking, while the other hung down past his jaw like a tallow candle that had drooped in the heat. He was what the Mexicans called a chongo, or droop horn. He trotted out a little piece into the clearing, then stopped to drop his head low. He went to snorting and shaking his horns and pawing up the dry dirt with his forefeet. He flung the dirt back over his neck and shoulders in great clouds of dust. I couldn't see the other bull yet, but I could tell by the sound of him that he was close and coming in a trot. I hollered back to Mama and Little Arliss. They're fixing a the fight right here, where we can all see it. There was a split rail fence around our cabin. I ran out and climbed up and took a seat on the top rail. Mama and Little Arliss came and climbed up to sit beside me. Then, from the other side of the clearing, came the second bull. He was the red roan I'd seen at the salt licks the day I'd shot the doe. He wasn't as tall and long-legged as the Chongo bull, but every bit as heavy and powerful, and while his horns were shorter, they were both curved right for hooking. Like the first bull, he came blaring out into the clearing, then stopped to snort and sling his wicked horns and paw up clouds of dust. He made it plain that he wanted to fight just as bad as the first bull. About that time, from somewhere behind the cabin came old Yeller. He charged through the rails, bristled up and roaring almost as loud as the bulls. All their bellering and snorting and dust pawing sounded like a threat to him. He'd come to run them away from the house. I hollered at him. Get back there, you rascal! I shouted. You're fixing to spoil our show! That stopped him, but he still wasn't satisfied. He kept baying the bulls till I jumped down and picked up a rock. I didn't have to throw it. All I had to do was draw back like I was gonna. That sent him flying back into the yard and around the corner of the cabin, yelling like I'd murdered him. That also put little Arliss on the fight. He started screaming at me. He tried to get down where he could pick up a rock, but Mama held him. Hush now, baby, she said. Travis isn't going to hurt your dog. He just doesn't want him to scare off the bulls. Well, it took some talking, but she finally got little Arliss's mind off hitting me with a rock. I climbed back up on the fence. I told Mama that I was betting on Chongo. She said she was betting her money on Roni because he had two fighting horns. We sat there and watched the bulls get ready to fight and talked and laughed and had ourselves a real good time. We never once thought about being in any danger. When we learned different, it was nearly too late. Suddenly, Chongo quit pawing the dirt and flung his tail into the air. Look out! I shouted. Here it comes! Sure enough, Chongo charged, pounding the hard pan with his feet and roaring his mightiest. And here came Roni to meet him. 
charging with his head low and his tail high in the air. I let out an excited yell. They met head on with a loud crash of horns and a jar so solid that it seemed like I could feel it clear up there on the fence. Roni went down. I yelled louder, thinking Chonga was winning. A second later, though, Roni was back on his feet and charging through the cloud of dust their hoofs had churned up. He caught Chongo broadside. He slammed his sharp horns up to the hilt in the shoulder of the mustard-colored bull. He drove against him so fast and hard that Chongo couldn't wheel away. All he could do was barely keep on his feet by giving ground. And here they came, straight for our fence rail. Land sakes! Mama cried suddenly and leaped from the fence, dragging little Arliss down after her. But I was too excited about the fight. I didn't see the danger in time. I was still astride the top rail when the struggling bulls crashed through the fence, splintering the posts and rails and toppling me to the ground almost under them. I lunged to my feet, wild with scare, and got knocked flat on my face in the dirt. I sure thought I was a goner. The roaring of the bulls was right in my ears. The hot, reeking scent of their blood was in my nose. The bone-crushing weight of their hooves was stomping all around me and over me, churning up such a fog of dust that I couldn't see a thing. Then Mama had me by the hand and was dragging me out from under, yelling in a scared voice, Run, Travis! Run! Well, she didn't have to keep hollering at me. I was running as fast as I ever hoped to run, and with her running faster and dragging me along by the hand, we scooted through the open cabin door just about a quick breath before Roni slammed Chongo against it. They hit so hard that the whole cabin shook. I saw great big chunks of dried mud chinking fall from between the logs. There for a second I thought Chongo was coming through that door right on top of us, but turned broadside like he was, he was too big to be shoved through such a small opening. Then a second later, he got off Roni's horn somehow and wheeled on him. Here they went then, down along the cabin wall, roaring and stomping and slamming their heels against the logs. I looked at Mama and little Arliss. Mama's face was white as a bedsheet. For once, little Arliss was so scared that he couldn't scream. Suddenly, I wasn't scared anymore. I was just plain mad. I reached for a braided rawhide whip that hung in a coil on a wooden peg driven between the logs. That scared Mama still worse. Oh no, Travis, she cried. Don't go out there. They're fixing to tear down the house, Mama, I said. But they might run over you, Mama argued. The bulls crashed into the cabin again. They grunted and strained and roared. Their horns and hoofs clattered against the logs. I turned and headed for the door. Looked to me like they'd kill us all if they ever broke through those log walls. Mama came running to grab me by the arm. Call the dog, she said. Put the dog after them. Well, that was a real good idea. I was half aggravated with myself because I hadn't thought of it. Here was a chance for that old yellow dog to pay back for all the trouble that he made around the place. I stuck my head out the door. The bulls had fought away from the house. Now they were busy tearing down more of the yard fence. I ducked out and around the corner. I ran through the dog run toward the back of the house, calling, Here, Yeller! Here, Yeller! Get him, boy! Sick him! Old Yeller was back there all right, but he didn't come and he didn't sick him. He took one look at me running toward him with that bull whip in my hand and knew I'd come to kill him. He tucked his tail and lit out in a yelling run for the woods. If there had been any way I could have done it, right then is when I would have killed him. But there wasn't time to mess with a fool dog. I had to do something about those bulls. They were wrecking the place, and I had to stop it. Papa had left me to look after things while he was gone, and I wasn't about to let two mad bulls tear up everything we had. I ran up to the bulls and went to work on them with the whip. It was a heavy 16-footer, and I'd practiced with it a lot. I could crack that rawhide popper louder than a gunshot. I could cut a branch as thick as my little finger off a green mesquite with it. But I couldn't stop those bulls from fighting. They were too mad. They were hurting too much already. I might as well have been spitting on them. I yelled and whipped them till I gave clear out. Still, they went right on with their roaring bloody battle. I guess they would have kept on fighting until they leveled the house to the ground if it hadn't been for a freak accident. We had a heavy two-wheeled Mexican cart that Papa used for hauling wood and hay. It happened to be standing out in front of the house, right where the ground broke away in a sharp slant toward the spring of creek. It had just come to me that I could get my gun and shoot the bulls when Chongo crowded Roni up against the cart. He ran that long, single horn clear up under Roni's belly. 
Now he gave such a big heave that he lifted Roni's feet clear off the ground and rolled him in the air. A second later, Roni landed flat on his back inside the bed of that dump cart with all four feet sticking up. I thought his weight would break the cart to pieces, but I was wrong. The cart was stronger than I'd thought. All the bull's weight did was tilt it so that the wheels started rolling, and away the cart went down the hill, carrying Roni with it. When that happened, Chongo was suddenly the silliest looking bull you ever saw. He stood with his tail up and his head high, staring after the runaway cart. He couldn't for the life of him figure out what he'd done with the roan bull. The rolling cart rattled and banged and careened its way down the slope till it was right beside the spring. There, one wheel struck a big boulder, bouncing the side of the cart so high that it turned over and skidded to a stop. The roan bull spilled right into the spring. Water flew in all directions. Roni got his feet under him. He scrambled up out of the hole. But I guess that cart ride and sudden wetting had taken all the fight out of him. Anyhow, he headed for the timber, running with his tail tucked. Water streamed down out of his hair, leaving a dark wet trail in the dry dust to show which way he'd gone. Chongo saw Roni then. He snorted and went after him. But when he got to the cart, he slid to a sudden stop. The cart, lying on its side now, still had that top wheel spinning around and around. Chongo had never seen anything like that. He stood and stared at the spinning wheel. He couldn't understand it. He lifted his nose up close to smell it. Finally, he reached out a long tongue to lick and taste it. That was a bad mistake. I guess the iron tire of the spinning wheel was roughed up pretty badly and maybe had chips of broken rock and gravel stuck to it. Anyhow, from the way Chongo acted, it must have scraped all the hide off his tongue. Chongo bawled and went running backward. He whirled away so fast that he lost his footing and fell down. He came to his feet and took out in the opposite direction from the roan bull. He ran, slinging his head and flopping his long tongue around, bawling like he'd stuck it into a bear trap. He ran with his tail clamped just as tight as the roan bull's. It was enough to make you laugh your head off, the way both those bad bulls had gotten the wits scared clear out of them, each one thinking he'd lost the fight. But they sure had made a wreck of the yard fence.